All right, we have made it to the end of the quarter. So we just have the exam review left and your final exam that you'll take online. Um, the review goes through practice problems, uh, similar to what you saw in the mid-quarter exam and then what we've done since then. Uh, and your review will be required to be uploaded and then it will unlock your test. The test will open Thursday and Friday. So you have any time those two days to do it. Um, <clears throat> so work through this review, make sure that you feel confident and comfortable with it. I'm gonna work through these problems really quickly, uh, just as kind of a option for you to check your answers. The PDF of the key is also uploaded, so you have those two options. Um, as we go, uh, we are going to uh, break this up into a couple different videos so that it's not one big long one. And you can listen for the mathy jokes in the video key as it says on here, and record their punchlines at the end of the review for a bonus point on your exam. Okay? Um, okay, let's start here. Um, writing it in standard form. Uh, again, we've practiced this quite a bit. Remember, standard form means that we take the term with the highest exponent and it gets to go first. Then we do the term with the next highest, and remember the sign is attached to the term, so that will move with it. And then lastly, that p-value doesn't have an exponent greater than 1. So we're just going to reorder these. Again, 6p to the 5th is the largest exponent, uh, minus 10p squared, the next largest, plus 2p. That would give our standard form. b says name the polynomial by its number of terms. There are three terms here, so this would be called a trinomial. Uh, then it says identify the leading coefficient. Remember, the leading coefficient is the number that leads the polynomial when it's in standard form. So in this case, it would be six. And it says state the degree of the polynomial, right? If we're stating the degree, that would be the highest exponent. So we look up here and the highest exponent is five. So this polynomial has a degree of five. Okay, going off those same things, the next one, um, that highest exponent is the a squared. So we're gonna go negative 10a squared minus three a. Classifying by its number of terms, this one has two terms, making it a binomial. Um, notice that leading coefficient out front is that negative 10. And if we were identifying this one's degree, we look for the highest exponent, which is 2. On number 3, again, this one only has one term, so it's already in standard form. Because it's one term, we call it a monomial. Uh, its leading coefficient is the number out front, so it's a 4. Remember, the x is the variable, not the coefficient. And then lastly, the degree, remember if there's no number written there, but there's still one variable, your degree is equal to one, okay? Number four, state the greatest common factor for the expression. So if we look at all of these terms and we say, all right, here's our expression, what's the greatest thing that can divide out of all of them? Well, it looks like six, two, and negative 10. We could divide out a two, they're all even numbers. And then they all have at least one p-value. So a two would divide out of everything and one of the p's. Number five, state the greatest common factor for the expression. Oh, um, <clears throat> if we're looking at this one, uh, it looks like we have a negative 30a and a negative 10a squared. Those both divide by 10. Um, and you can write negative 10 because you could pull a negative out of both of them or a positive 10. It doesn't matter when you're talking about the greatest common factor. Um, however, if there is a double negative in there, I usually pull it out. Number six, which of the following represents the simplified expression in standard form? Notice we're just adding, subtracting polynomials. This one's subtraction, so make sure that that negative applies to each piece of that second polynomial. So we've got a negative 2x squared, and then a negative times a negative 7 is a positive 7, and then a negative times that 2x to the fourth would be minus 2x to the fourth. So once we have that, we can combine our like terms. So it looks like here we've got an 8x to the 4th and a negative 2x to the 4th. So I know that it's going to be a 6x to the 4th. So either this one or this one with my multiple choice. Um, notice you have a 6 and you have a 7. That would make 13. Um, so it looks like it's going to be D because there's a 13 there. And then we just check the negative 8x squared minus 2x squared does give us the 10x squared. So we would mark D as our final answer. Graphing absolute value functions. So number seven um, says f of x is equal to one half x minus three plus two. So if we're looking at this, um, the vertex again, remember, comes from 
um, those two shifts, the horizontal shift, the H and the K, and remember the H is always opposite. So if I'm pulling out the vertex, this would be right three up two, so we're sitting at the point three, two. The domain on every absolute value function is all real numbers or negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, to identify the range, you can either graph it first or look at the equation and notice that the one half out front is a positive value. So it's not opening down, it's opening up, that V. And we know that it's at 3, 2. So this point right here is like 2 on my Y value. So it's going to go from 2 up to infinity. And we put a bracket on 2. Or um, those of you that like to write it as greater than or equal to the value 2, that works too. So transformations, just going off of our function, um, it looks like we are going to shift. We're going to go up 2. We're going to go right 3. Um, and... That one half out front, remember it's out front, so it's going to be a vertical shrink by one half. Okay, so when we graph this, we go right three, we go up two, there's our vertex, um, and then we shrink it vertically by one half, so we go up one over two, up one over two, till we can create that V, our absolute value. Okay, number eight, again, we're graphing a function. And notice this time, um, we do have a negative out front, so this guy's going to open down. Um, we've got that leading coefficient that's negative. It's going to move down, right, 1. Um, it looks like it's going to move to the left, 6, and then remember the 3's on the inside. So this guy's going to shrink it back by 1 third. Because remember, if we were to factor out, or in other words, divide a 3 out of each piece on the inside of these absolute value bars, we would get x plus 2. And that tells us kind of that's where our vertex is going to be, right? It's going to shrink it back to 2 instead of being at 6. So I know that my vertex here is at negative 2, negative 1. Um, the domain, again, all real numbers. And on the range, again, remember this one's opening down, and it goes all the way up till that y value of negative 1. So our range is going to be either from negative infinity up to negative 1. Remember, if you use negative infinity, it has to go first so that it's in the order of least to greatest, or y is always going to be less than or equal to negative 1. Okay, Transformations, again, this guy, he's going to reflect, right, over the x-axis, so we need to know that he's opening down. Um, he's then going to shift down 1, and left 6, um, and then, right, he's going to horizontally shrink, Oops, two L's by one third. So again, if we go down, um, it's going to open down. We know that. Uh, we're going to go down one. We're going to go, I guess I should show you on this. So we start at the origin, right? We're going to go down one, and then we're going to go to the left six. So one, two, three, four, five, off the graph six, right? But we're going to shrink back by a third. So it divides it by three, which leaves us at two. So we know that our vertex there is going to be um, right here. And again, we check that with the vertex we wrote up here, negative 2, negative 1. That looks good. And then we have a slope of 3. Because of that 3 on the inside, we do have that slope of 3. So I'm going to go down 3 over 1, down 3 over 1, because we know that it was opening down. Again, you can plot these on your graph. You can plot them on Desmos. Um, those are all going to be helpful uh, when your graphing. Okay. All right. I'm going to do a couple more of these and then we will stop the video and start a new one. Um, on this one, this says solve each equation and then state the sets of the number system to which your solution belongs. So you guys are pretty good with these ones. Um, as we multiply here, we're going to go to minus 35x, multiply negative 7 in, and we get plus 7. Remember, we're just moving all the x's to one side. So if I add 35x, and there's that 2 and the 7 on the left side as well. So I'm going to combine those and get 9. Then I have negative 25 plus 34x on the right side. Uh, I then add the 25, and I get 34 is equal to 34x. If we divide both sides by 34, x is going to be equal to 1. So x is equal to 1. Remember, 1 belongs to the natural numbers. And if it belongs to the natural, it's also a whole number. Whole numbers are also integers. 
which are rational, which are real, which are complex. So working our way out on our number system. Uh, number 10, same idea. So we're going to distribute this negative 2. So we get 6x plus 8 on the left. We get negative 2x minus 8 on the right. And then we move some things around. So we add 2x here, add 2x here. We get 8x plus 8 is equal to negative 8. We add 8. Oh, let's not do that. Let's go the other way. We minus 8 from the left side. So we get 8x is equal to negative 16. Divide by um, the 8 there, and we get x is equal to negative 2. So again, x is a negative value on this one. So it's not a natural or a whole number. This starts in the integers, and then it's rational and real and complex. All right, so you're making a blanket with a fringe border of equal width on each side, as shown in the diagram. The length of the blanket without the fringe is 72 inches. So you can see that on the picture there, right? They're saying this is 72 inches. Um, and its width is 48 inches. And then it looks like they've added a fringe on each side of length x. So I'm going to just try to draw a little picture of what that would look like. So if this is my length up here, um, it looks like this is x. This is 72 inches, and then there's another x length on the other end of fringe. So <clears throat> when we're talking about polynomials here, um, I'm going to represent that length as um, x, right, plus 72 plus x. And if I add x and x, that's really just 2x plus 72. That's the length of that whole side. And then if we look again here, it's kind of the same idea. You have a fringe of x on each end, and this length inside they said was 48 inches. So in total, um, this side here is like 2x plus 48. So part A asks us to find the perimeter. So if I want to find perimeter, remember perimeter is just distance around the object. So you can just think about it as 2x plus 72, right? Plus 2x plus 48 plus... Oops, 2x plus 72 plus 2x plus 48. We're just adding the distance all around the outside, and then we combine like terms. So we've got 2x, 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 2x. That gives me 8x. Um, 72 plus 48 plus 72 plus 48 gives us that 240, and that represents inches. So that would be the perimeter, depending on how big you build your fringe. Write a polynomial in standard form that represents area. So area is length times width. So again, our length was 2x plus 72 multiplied by the width is 2x plus 48. And this looks like a good foiling problem. So we distribute 2x, 2x is 4x squared. 2x um, times 48 gives us 96x. Um, then we multiply the 72 by the 2x, which gives us 144x, plus 72 times 48, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, if we combine those middle terms, we get 4x squared plus 240x um, plus 3, 4, 5, 6. And this would be square inches because it's area that we're looking at there. Um, part C says find the perimeter and the area of the blanket when the fringe is 4. So <clears throat> um, we are going to look at, let's say, the perimeter. And if the fringe is 4, that means x is equal to 4. So I just take my perimeter uh, polynomial from part A, and I do 8 times 4, put 4 in for x. So we've got 32 plus 240. So 272 inches on that one. Area. Again, we take our area polynomial, oops, and we just put in 4 everywhere there's an x. And then we multiply that out and we simplify and we should get about 44, 80 square inches. All right, let's just finish out this page and we'll start a new one. Um, given the graph of the line, determine the slope, y-intercept, and then write the equation of the line in slope-intercept form. So looking at this first one, um, maybe a little bit hard to tell, but if we just go off our intercepts here, that might help us. So notice this is going up 6, and then it's going to the right 3. So rise over run, that would be 6 over 3 for our slope. 
And if we simplify that, that's 2. So our slope here is going to be 2. The y-intercept there is crossing at 6. So if you just put 6 or 0, 6, right, is that point. And then slope-intercept form, we put our mx plus our b value. Oops, but let's put a 6 there instead of an actual b. Very good. Um, on the next one, same idea. So maybe I'm going to use the intercepts here. You don't have to use the intercepts. You could use other points if you can tell where they're crossing. Um, this looks like it's going down 3, and then it's going to the right 4, um, which is negative 3 fourths. So rise over run. And it looks like it's crossing right at positive 3 on that y-axis there. So our equation would be negative 3 fourths x. Don't forget your x. Plus 3. Okay, uh, that's it for page 1 on the front and the back.